The format of the me- tonight's meeting is we have a guest speaker share their experience, strength and hope on how Alcoholics Anonymous program of recovery is working in their lives for 15 to 20 minutes. Tonight we have asked Jake to share. Um, good evening everyone, my name's Jake, I'm an alcoholic. Um, thanks for having me down tonight. I don't often make it down to the south side and it's always a treat. Um, you know, my story's um, a pretty ordinary one, really. Um, I didn't think so when I came into AA. Um, a few of you have probably already heard my story. A few of you have probably heard it in the last week. Um, I remember people getting up and saying that when I first came to AI, I didn't really know what they were talking about. Um, they'd say, you might be bored of my story, but I've only got one. And um, when I came to AI, I had about 20 different stories, and none of them quite joined. And um, I kind of learnt the truth about my alcoholism and my story from listening to other people's stories, you know, little, little uh, bit by bit. The... Uh, <coughs> The dishonesty that I built up in my life was sort of chipped away by hearing people um, relive things that had happened to them through their alcoholism, and I would um, have these hazy little recollections of that happening to me as well. And over the years, you know, the story comes together and it becomes your story. Um, I was a, I was a shy, um, I was an inwardly shy, nervous kid who thought that everybody else knew what was going on and I didn't. Um, but I also knew early on that I had to project to the world that I was, com- I was very confident and that I knew exactly what was going on. And, um, that's how I lived my life for a, for a long time, you know, not letting people really see what was going on inside of me. Um, <clears throat> with occasional sort of explosions of tantrums as a kid and, um, and then explosions of drunken aggression as a drunk. Um, yeah, I... Um, I grew up in a, in a family of sort of regular middle class family, no, no alcoholism in my immediate family, um, no reasons to have drank abnormally, no reasons to have felt the way I felt as a kid, um, it just was the way it was. Um, I used to say that uh, as soon as I had self-awareness I was self-conscious and I think that's true. And I also believe that as soon as I had a grasp on language, I had an inner dialogue. As soon as I um, knew what the words, you're not as good as everybody else, meant, I was saying, you're not as good as anybody as everybody else in my head in many situations. And um, <clears throat> I think that's the kind of, the wonder of human beings is we've got language, but the sort of flip side of that is you wind up having an inner dialogue. And, um, in a dialogue serves us no good purpose whatsoever. And um, I always think that it's doing some good if I'm thinking about things and talking, but really I've learned through AA that when I'm thinking and when I've got that inner dialogue going on, nothing, nothing good's happening, you know. The good stuff that's happening is happening outside of my mind. Um, anyway, uh, I picked up my first drink when I was uh, about 13 years old. I just performed a puppet show to a um, group of primary school students and I was in my first year of high school. Um, we had consumed uh, a fair amount of rocket fuel, sort of mixture of whatever we could steal out of a mate's dad's liquor cabinet on the way to the school, from our high school to the primary school. I um, performed a, a stellar performance as a puppeteer, I remember that. Um, I remember having no nerves before the, before the performance and I remember um, kissing the girl that I fancied all year in the, um, in the reading corner after the performance and then um, my form teacher thinking it was kind of odd that we were behaving like that and asking us if we'd been drinking and I wasn't reprimanded for that in any way shape or form um, I was just she was a nice uh, sort of left wing uh, teacher who just who said you know you should watch out with alcohol and sort of just gave me a little bit of, bit of a warning um, but all, all I remembered was I put that stuff in my system and then everything I wanted to happen all year happened in, within a space of half an hour. And um, within a week of that, I was, um, um, I was at another booze up at the end of school and I was drunk and then I was just 
drinking at any given opportunity from there on in, pretty much. Um, yeah, and it was pretty, you know, it was a slow road down for me. For a long time, alcohol did what, um, what I wanted it to do, and there weren't too many uh, side effects. I, I remember um, sort of towards my late teens, occasionally I'd have these sort of off nights where I would have drunk a little bit too much, a little too fast, and I'd throw up. Um, and one time I threw up on a whole party's coats. It was a nice cold day in Wellington, and there was a pile of... Everybody was in attendance at the party's jackets were in one room, and I decided that was the room I was going to go and sort of just have a breather. I wasn't planning on spewing on all of my classmates' jackets, but I went in there and, the, you know, the old familiar room starts spinning and all the rest of it, so I was deeply ashamed by that, and I spent the next two weeks explaining to everyone that actually I was a really successful drinker and it was just a one-off. I was 17 at that stage and had this sort of illustrious drinking career that had gone quite nicely. And, um, and I always managed to find somebody else in my um, peer group who drank more than I did and um, got into more trouble than I did and got into fights and, you know, threw up more often than I did. I had a mate, Gabe Chambers, bless his heart, he spewed like every time we went out. So if it happened to me, you know, once in a while, it was no big deal. It was usually him. And, um, and then I sort of thought I'd mastered drinking. Physically, I wasn't getting sick and stuff anymore. An older kid told me that um, if you want to avoid having a spinning room, you've just got to drink more. Um, so that's what I did. And I can't remember having that spinning room after my early days of drinking because I'd just sort of passed out, I guess. Um, yeah, but I couldn't turn into the kind of drunk who couldn't go home, um, who, you know, would be the last, the last person standing and then I'd have to drink with strangers and then I'd drink on my own and I didn't care. Um, you know, even my sort of hardened drinking buddies would actually um, say they were going to the toilet and then they just wouldn't come back because they knew that... Um, that if they hung out with me, it would just be a disaster because I would not stop. And, um, and blackouts started coming into my life and at first they were just couldn't quite remember a conversation and then it was couldn't remember being at that bar after that bar and then it was didn't know if it was the sun was coming up or the sun was going down, didn't know what I'd said and chances were that when I was in that state, something, my behaviour had been shocking, you know, it was very, very rare that I would have a blackout and sort of call around my mates to see if I'd um, done anything wrong and, and, I, and I'd been alright. Um, so anyway, yeah, I just went on like that, achieving very little in life, avoiding um, taking the easiest, softest road I could find, and the easiest, softest road for me was to, um, was to do dead-end jobs or be on the dole, to drop out of art school, to, um, you know, wreck every relationship I was in, to avoid work at all costs and to drink whenever I got the opportunity. And that's what I did. And through that, you know, my self-esteem, if there was any to begin with, just got chipped away piece by piece until there was just nothing left. And I got into AA. And I came into AA because uh, I told... Um, I told a friend's girlfriend that he was an alcoholic and that he needed to go to AA. And I told her because I knew he wouldn't listen to me because I was exactly the same as he was. But the reason why I did that is because I wanted somebody else to walk through the doors of AA before me so that they could hold my hand, metaphorically speaking, and get me through the doors of my first meeting. So that's what I did. Um, Apart from alcohol, my friend Rupert's, Rupert's greatest weakness was women, um, and he would pretty much do whatever a girlfriend told him to do, and, and I, I knew that. Um, the girl that told him, incidentally, is an alcoholic as well, and she never found these rooms. And Rupert, my buddy who got me in here, um, he picked up a drink again after two years, and that's a few years ago now. Um, but I always figure if I stick around here, one day he might want to come back, you know. And I'll be able to uh, offer him the same, the same service he did me. Um, so yeah, I got into AA and I, I really didn't like the place. Um, I knew I had to be here, but I, um, 
but I just didn't like it. I was, I was off work on compensation. I injured myself and I'd had a sort of minor, minor operation and couldn't work for a few months, which was great. I mean, I you know, theoretically could have got to a lot of meetings, but I didn't. I was going to one meeting a week. It was um, a daytime meeting. Most people there were in my situation, although I looked down on all of them. Um, and I always walked out of that meeting feeling worse than when I'd walked in. I looked for all the differences and found it very hard to listen to the similarities. And the only thing that really saved me in the early days was I bought a copy of the big book off a guy who was the literature representative at that meeting and he'd been sober for 20 years at that stage. I bought that book off him and the next time I saw him was about six months later and he was sitting in a pub with a beer in his hand and I was just walking past the window but I could hear the conversation and he was telling this guy he was drinking with how he'd been sober for 20 years, you know, and how he wasn't a hopeless drunk because he'd, he'd done that. And um, I knew what that was like from having sort of brief periods of sobriety before I got into AA. Whenever I'd pick up a drink again, I'd bore people with a story of how I used to have it together. Um, and AA's taught me that I've only got it together for one day. And if I'm not sober today, it doesn't mean jack what happened yesterday or for the nine or so years leading up to this point, you know. What really matters is that I don't pick up a drink um, today, you know. Anyway, I got into meetings um, and I didn't like them, as I've said, but people put their hand out to me and, um, and after a while, you know, I was going to that meeting and um, I was jogging a lot, which I'd never done in my life. But I had all this energy and anger sort of coming up in me and jogging seemed like a really good way to get it out. And after, um, after jogging about 10k on concrete every night with my mate Rupert for, um, for about three months my knees crapped out and I, all this rage came up in me and I just didn't know what to do with it. And I was storming around the house cursing this God that I didn't believe in or thought I didn't believe in. Um, uh, for this injury and my girlfriend at the time said well why don't you go to another meeting of AA I'm sure there's more than that one meeting you've been going to um, on Monday mornings and and so I did, I went to another meeting in another part of Sydney and I encourage anybody that's new to get around to as many meetings as possible um, because if I hadn't gone to that meeting that night I wouldn't be standing here today almost 10 years sober um, I went to that meeting I heard hope you know, there were there are people in there that were not only sober but had lives that I, that I wanted, you know. There were people talking about finishing university degrees that they had dropped out of years earlier. There were people, um, you know, there were, pe there were people in there really living the program. They weren't just getting by, you know, they were living full lives and, and I really wanted it from that moment on. I also wanted to spend as little time with my girlfriend as possible at that juncture. Um, you know, God works in mysterious ways and everything sort of aligned to getting me to, his, to a lot of meetings in those days. I went to a meeting every night for two years after only attending one a week for the first three months of my recovery. I found a sponsor. Um, I was terrified. Uh, I'd always been terrified of, of everything and coming into AA didn't change that in a hurry. Um, I thought I was waiting for the perfect sponsor. It took me... 12 months to ask somebody to be my sponsor because in my mind nobody had what I wanted yet but really what was going on was I was just too scared to ask anybody and um, when I did finally ask that guy um, he took me through the steps you know and um, gently at first and a little bit more rigorously later on but I um, you know I I wrote down on paper the truth of my story of my life to that point um, what had happened, I had a good hard look at it, and then I, um, and then I read, I read that um, that moral inventory to that guy, you know, and that was one of the greatest nights of my life. Um, I wouldn't have thought that when I was a young guy, that one of the greatest nights of my life was going to be reading a list of character defects to um, some bloke I met in AA, but. Um, you know, it really was uh, such a relief just to, um, you know, just to, to get that stuff off my chest 
and you know, and since then in the program, I haven't worked things perfectly, but I've always had a home group. I've always kept in regular contact with other members of Alcoholics Anonymous. I've never gone more than a week without attending an AA meeting. I like to go to three meetings a week these days. I'd like to go to four, really. And when I was single, I used to go to more meetings. And um, I don't know how it works or why it works, why it makes me feel the way I feel when I leave a meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous. It's, it's still beyond my comprehension that I can come in here with the rats in the head <coughs> thinking that the world owes me something and it's not happening and I can walk out the doors an hour later and feel grateful just to be alive and to not have to pick up a drink today and to, to not have to come out of some hazy blackout in some strange house not knowing how I got there or who I'm with or you know, coming out of a hazy blackout in a police cell or, um, you know, the numerous, just the horror of it, you know. Since I've been in AA, the horror has ended. I, it hasn't always been easy mentally for me. There's been, you know, there's tough, there are tough days and tough things happen and there are tough days when nothing tough's happened. There's just, you know, I've got a, I've got a pessimistic mind it's always looking for the, for the worst in life and it's always looking for the deficits. So I've had bad days in AA, but the horror has ended, you know. That, that, that horror movie stuff, that feeling that you might actually be a werewolf. I used to have this white suit that I used to wear out. It was a while back and I, I bought this white suit in this op shop and every time I wore that suit I had to have it dry cleaned. And I thought that was just the deal with suits, you know. You wore them once, you had to have them dry cleaned because every time it was just covered in blood and wine and dirt and just stuff, you know. It was like I was a werewolf. It was like this regular sort of nice normal guy and then I'd go, oh, I think I'm just going to go out and have, um, have a couple of beers tonight, darling. And, you know, 24 hours later there'd be rips in here and there'd be blood and there'd be hazy recollections of maybe attacking somebody. It was like... <laughs> that was the reality of my life. And I've, you know... I've been through the steps and I've had to make amends for a lot of those things, but there's people, I just can't remember, there's this one really hazy recollection of just laying into this guy in a bar, him begging me not to hit him, and I you know, don't think of myself as the kind of guy that hits people, and I still don't know to this day if it definitely happened, but it's there, you know, little things like that, or, um, yeah... Anyway, you get the picture. I'm grateful to be here tonight. I'm grateful for another sober day, and um, I'm going to wrap it up with three minutes to spare. Thanks, Paul. Yeah. <laughs> we'll now observe the seventh tradition of alcohol. So I'm starting.